podcast. I don't charge any union fees. I don't charge any admission fees. I don't charge no Patreon fees. It's all for free. My next guest is Mr. Stuart Biggins. Unidentified flying objects. I hope you survived the earthquake today, and I hope you uh, subscribe to my channel. Tell a friend, tell someone you don't like. Either way, it's all the same to me. Take it away, Howard. Ciao, baby. Stuart Biggins, welcome to the Voodoo Room. Thanks, Pete. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. It's been a while. We've been trying to get this uh, up and going for a while and we finally got you. So I'm pleased to have you on the show, buddy. Oh, good. No, I'm very, I'm, I'm proud to know you. You're a good guy. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, you know, we, we, I guess I'm going to start off with a topic that most people feel um, – I don't know how people feel about it these days, but I definitely know if you went back probably 30, 40 years ago, you would probably, if you mentioned the word UFOs or aliens, you would probably be labelled as a mad person. But, you know, in the current day and age, uh, we're getting more and more um, evidence and um, uh, uh, reflection uh, uh, in regards to uh, sightings and uh, uh, people... um, uh, uh, confer- uh, top level people confirming that uh, uh, of what's been uh, seen in the skies. So, how well do you have? A, how well do you have to get to know someone before you tell them tell them your UFO story? Uh, sometimes ten minutes. <laughs> it's it's as it's as it's as sort of. It's as easy as that, you know. It's there just seems to be a feeling that you get when you meet somebody that uh, you feel comfortable with them, and I don't know. It's it's like they're vibrating on the same frequency that you are, which makes it much easier to you know to communicate when you you know you know when you've got a really good vibe for somebody and you feel like you can trust them. Um, sometimes you know when you meet somebody, you've got this overwhelming feeling of I just need to get out of the room. Uh, I don't know what this person's on about. They're a bit guarded or a bit over the top. Uh, but generally, you know, I've, I've kept I've kept a lot of what I've seen and what's happened to me to myself because it it just doesn't seem to come over that well. And it, sometimes it comes across as being unbelievable. Um, but but now in, in this current current day, uh, hang on. This current this current age, you know, where you know governments around the world are now admitting that they've got uh, a lot of film footage and documentation that backs up the claims that, uh, that a lot of their employees have had over the years that they've seen things and they've registered things and they've recorded things that they can't uh, explain. Uh, it's just much much easier now for me to to talk about it without being ridiculed and feeling like I'm a fool or I'm jumping on some kind of bandwagon because, you know, ever since I was really little, um, I've had things happen to me. I've had things visit me. Uh, And the most profound experience I had was when I was in Spain in uh, 1992. Um, It changed my life. It basically ruined the better part of a year of my life. I, I had a complete mental um, meltdown. Um, my wife thought, you know, she was really worried about me, and then her mother came out and stayed with us. And I, I literally, I couldn't work. I was a, a basket case from what I saw, and and I guess what what was implanted in me, or what what message that I got from from my experience. And uh, and I guess you're probably going to ask me what happened. <laughs> Well, it's interesting that you're in um, Spain in 1992 because I was actually heading over to Barcelona um, from Malta um, in August of 1992. Um, they, well, the Olympic Games were just about to start. Um, were you around 
that time when the Olympic Games were in Barcelona. Yeah, I was, yeah. Yeah, yeah so I was planning my trip uh, from Italy to Spain and uh, I got – anyway, my, my story is that I got, got cut short because my I had an illness and I had to get back to Australia and uh, deal with that. But um, it would have been interesting if I had to come across uh, someone like yourself at that stage, uh, Stewie. So there you go. Uh, they say after you win lottery <clears throat> once, you're more likely to win it again. So since that day in 1966, have you seen or experienced any other strange unexplained phenomenon? Well, funny you should say that. Uh, nearly every night on a clear night up here in Bright, uh, I'm always out there looking and I always see something. Yes. There is always something to see because you, you know, if, if you're not looking, you don't see. Um, I've seen, oh, I've seen things as close as a kilometre away, you know, up on up on, up on Mount Porpunka, uh, coming back from uh, Myrtleford, just driving along the road, you know, looking up to the right where there's this big pine plantation. There was a big cutaway uh, in between two two pine plantations, and there's a road in between. And uh, there was a, just a big UFO just sitting straight in the middle between these trees. And I had somebody in the car with me, and uh, and I was pretty chilled out. And I said, uh, can you see that uh, in between the trees? And he couldn't. And I said, well, just, just take a couple of deep breaths and just chill out and then have another look. Anyway, he, I slowed down the car to about 60 kilometres an hour, and he looked up and, and he saw it. And he said, "How come I didn't see it a couple of minutes ago?" And my real, my ex, my simple explanation to anybody who who sees them and then or who can't see them is that you got to be vibrating. It's it's like you got to be vibrating at a particular frequency to to allow these these visions or allow yourself to, to see this because not, not everybody does. I mean, I know you've heard, you've all, everyone's heard the stories of, you know, like hillbillies, you know, out the back there, God damn, I saw that thing and it come out the sky and, you know, shot a beam, a red beam, a laser at me. You know, um, a lot of, uh, it's, they always seem to, well, not always seem, but there always seems to be a, an over-representation of people out in the bush that see these. And uh, I know a lot of people that that I would I would normally never open up to to say, oh look, I've seen a UFO, or I've I've had these experiences. I mean, there was a guy um, that used to do a lot of the steel work for this building company um, that I used to work for. This guy Les Les from Atlas Steel, yeah, g'day Les. Anyway, he was you know he was just a straight shooting guy. You know, had a '67 Mustang and had a, you know three sons, and they were just the absolute salt of the earth. And uh, and he was about the toughest bloke you know, you'd ever met. And you'd ring him up and go, yeah, Atlas. And anyway, one day I don't know why I just we were sitting sitting you know in the lunchroom on this job in Little Burke Street and uh, someone, one, I think one of the guys said, oh, has anybody seen a UFO? And then Les started, the old Les. He said, yep, they're driving the truck out uh, out near Romsey. He just bought like a farm out near Romsey. Anyway, the truck broke down. He get got out of the truck, couldn't figure out why. And then there was this big shiny disc hovering over the top of his truck. And he thought, <laughs> the first thing he thought was, he grabbed his ass just in case, <laughs> just in case. But he, he said he was absolutely petrified, petrified because he jumped back in the truck. He just he tried to start it, wouldn't start. And it was just, it was completely dead. And uh, he sat in the truck trembling for about an hour. And this thing just sort of was just sort of hovering around the top of the truck. And uh, another car came into view. Um, this was sort of mid evening, about seven, sort of like seven o'clock at night, like in winter. So it was dark, and you could see another car coming towards him. Anyway, that car's lights went off, and obviously they saw what had happened, but they had coasted up to within about 50 meters of where Les's truck was parked. And they get out of the car and they're just yelling at each other, Can you see this? I'm not crazy. Can you see this? You haven't anybody got a camera. I mean, this is back in the 80s. You know, no one had a phone camera. Uh, so I 
think I'm pretty sure from from what Les, from all I remember the story Les telling me, because this is back in like '96 when when Les, you know, basically gave up this information. Uh, he said the the other people said that they were going to go and report it to the police, and Les just went. Yeah, good luck with that. <laughs> <laughs> so let Les wasn't going to go and report it. Les no. didn't want to be on record because Les is a, was a you know, he's a he's a builder. He's a, yeah, a yeah, conservative a, builder. Very conservative, mm. but um, you know, I've I've seen Les quite a few times after that, mm. and and I do bring up do bring up the subject with him a bit just to just to Clara. make sure. Just, Make sure that he's he, he's okay with it because mm. a lot of people aren't okay with it. You yeah. know, I wasn't okay with it for a long time. Mm. Um, I, I honestly thought my wife and my mother-in-law thought I was mad mm. uh, and, until they actually saw the same thing because mm. this UFO that I saw, it used to hover over my house mm. you know, sort of like once a week and I'd be having conversations with this thing and, and it kind of drove me a bit bonkers there for a while but I got used to it. And uh, I went on a bit of a journey to find other people that had seen the same thing. And I, uh, a woman um, who just lived literally, you know, about five kilometres away, rang me one day to, for me to do work on on her house. And um, this is, uh, I actually hadn't worked for six months. I hadn't really done anything because I was still really kind of come into grips with what had happened to me. I basically lost two and a half hours of time and I can't remember what had happened. I mean, something did happen in that two and a half hours, but it was so profound. It had such an effect on me subconsciously and psychologically that I blocked it out. I just couldn't remember. And I knew that there was some kind of message in there. I knew that I'd had some kind of communication, but I I just couldn't verbalise it. It was just... just on the tip of my tongue. Anyway, this woman rings up and says, can you come and have a look and give me a quote on some work on my house? And I went, okay. And I, um, I pulled up in the driveway and I think to myself, how did this woman get my phone number? So I, I thought I'll probably get to the bottom of it. Anyway, she opens the door and, wow, I just had this overwhelming dread come over me and I was just, oh, I don't feel very well. Like I, I really shouldn't be here. I'm sorry, I don't feel so good. She said, oh, well, come in, have a glass of water. It's okay, it's okay. And I just felt the need to tell her what had happened to me and what, I, what I'd seen. And uh, anyway, I, she got me, into the, got me into the kitchen. I sat down in the kitchen with her and um, I started telling her what I saw. And I, and I was really emotional about it. I was crying and I was a real mess. And during my, you know, my explanation of what I'd, what I'd gone through, her husband comes in as well and he's this Scottish um, real estate guy and he's got this real look on look, look of concern on his face as well and uh, anyway his wife who's Spanish she's about 60 something I'm pretty sure she's about 60 something uh, says honey go and get my scrapbook so he, he, he sort of disappears out of the room comes back with a scrapbook and after I told her like what I'd shown she said okay I'm going to tell you my story Open the first page. I opened the first page. 1952, little girl disappears in park. And I'm reading it and it's, yeah, it's like a 11-year-old girl disappears in a park uh, on a Sunday afternoon at 10 to 6. Uh, witnesses This is in she- Melbourne, right? Somewhere. No, no, no this, this is, is in Spain. Spain. Okay. This yep. is in Spain. Yep. Sorry, yep. yeah. Yeah, uh, and and uh, and I'm reading on, and and she said, uh, and, w- and what does it? What you can read Spanish? What does it say? That, well, the witnesses say she disappeared, and the police say the this that they that they are you know, looking for her, and you know, possibly there's a kidnapping, and and all the witnesses were saying, no, you don't need to go looking anywhere. She just evaporated just poof, gone. Anyway, two weeks to the day. Like I, so I'm reading that. I'm like, oh, my God. And I, and I, and I get to, this ne- to the next page, and it's like a full page. And it's two weeks to the day. Uh, it's 8.30 at night, uh, two weeks to the day. Uh, little girl reappears in the same place, in the same park. And... 
anyway, they they interview her, and she has this almost biblical uh, experience with whoever had had, had taken her away. Mm. Uh, it was a really pleasurable experience for her. And when I say biblical, it really was quite biblical. It wasn't, you know, she was not making any references to God or Jesus, but she was making references to a supreme being uh, and the message that it had for her to pass on to her friends and to her age group and, and to humanity. Mm-hmm.